Hello, this is Political Dharma, and I'm your host, Alan. Today's topic is the Progressive New Economic Bill of Rights, also called the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights. This is being promoted by a number of progressive politicians, including Bernie Sanders and Nina Turner in our current uh, political campaign in Ohio, I think it is. And it came to my attention, once again, I've heard of it before, but not given it a lot of thought. It came to my attention three days ago when the Jacobin radio podcast hosted by Susie Weissman, she interviewed a, a couple of people who were talking about their version of the new Economic Bill of Rights. They were Alan Minsky, who's the executive director of the Progressive Democrats of America, and Harvey Kay, who is Professor Emeritus of Democracy and Justice Studies at the University of Wisconsin, Green Bay, as well as the director of the Center for History and Social Change at that same university. While they were talking, a couple of things caught my attention about how they described it and what they had to say about it, which I'll get into a little bit. First, I want to mention, for those of you who listen somewhat regularly, that I'm no longer live streaming this show on Saturday mornings at 9 o'clock. I'm not live streaming it at all. This is a recorded version. It's being recorded Saturday morning. It's about quarter past 11 on April 30th, last day of April. I'm no longer live streaming because I discovered that when I have to be ready to do this at a particular time, I may not be ready. And if you had the misfortune of seeing last week's show or listening to it, you found that at 9 o'clock on Saturday morning, sometimes I don't really know what I want to talk about, and I'm somewhat incoherent and rambling. So not my best show, but still kind of fun to do. Anyway, this version is being recorded, and future versions will be recorded as well. So the 21st Century Economic Bill of Rights being promoted by Bernie Sanders and these other two fellows, Alan Minsky and Harvey K. Uh, it's a proposal for a way to rally progressives around a particular platform or agenda or set of, I wouldn't say talking points, but a set of maybe principles and get them to back a set of policy programs once they get into office. So it's a way of presenting a vision, they say, a rallying point, a campaign document, a government program all at once to rally people around and to help elect progressives. They would like progressives to adopt this. They would like uh, progressive politicians to adopt this. And they would like progressive uh, citizens to back politicians who subscribe to this program. They find it as a way to distinguish themselves from other Democrats, the uh, corporate Democrats, or what would you call them? Sometimes they're called centrists, they're moderates. I prefer to call them corporate because they're so dependent on corporate campaign donations. It's a way to distinguish their program from that program and from the program of the Republican Party, which I'm not sure what it is anymore other than fealty to Donald Trump. Uh, the moderate Democrats, if you want to call them that, I don't like calling them that. I'll call them that for the sake of convenience. They don't really have a program. Their program in the last couple of elections seemed to be, we're not Trump. We're not going to do the things Trump is doing. Uh, we're going to somehow get us back to normal, whatever normal is, after a major economic crisis in 2008 and a major pandemic the last two years. What is normal? I think we've mostly uh, given up on the idea that there is such a thing as normal. At least I have. So they had this thing to talk about. Let me play a little clip from this in which... Uh, which one is it? Harvey K. describes exactly what he means or, or how he would describe this policy program. The Economic Bill of Rights that we're proposing, which is an update of FDR's Economic Bill of Rights of 1944, is essentially, and I know we're using the word progressive, this is the social democratic agenda in one sense, but it's also a social democratic vision. You want to call a democratic socialist? I don't have any reservations about doing that. But more importantly, it's social democratic. A uh, little clip at the end, but he re reiterated the phrase social democratic. Uh, that caught my attention because it was a more explicit statement of a particular approach to government intervention in the economy. And later on, they emphasize that it's not socialist, it's social democratic. 
I'll play the clip a little more towards the end. And what I want to do now first, though, is give you a sense of what kind of items are in this uh, social democratic platform for progressives. And I'm going to put it up on the screen and then read it to you. Uh, number one, the right to a useful job that pays a living wage. Number two, right to a voice in the workplace through a union and collective bargaining. Number three, right to comprehensive quality health care. Number four, a right to complete cost-free public education and access to broadband internet. I guess those go together because uh, the internet is necessary for secondary education, especially in a time of pandemic when students are at home. Number five, the right to decent, safe, affordable housing. Number six, a clean environment and a healthy planet. Number seven, right to meaningful endowment of resources at birth and a secure retirement. Number eight, right to a sound banking and financial services system. And number nine, an equitable and economically fair justice system. Number 10, right to recreation and participation in a civic and democratic life. Now, that's quite a list of things, and it's not exactly the same list as Bernie Sanders. Bernie Sanders has a list of like six principles that are somewhat similar. Right to a job, pays a living wage, right to quality health care, right to complete education, affordable housing, clean environment, secure retirement. So it's pretty much overlaps, but it doesn't have all the rest. Although at the very end of it, there's a mention of additional democratic rights like voting rights and uh, getting rid of Citizens United, public funding for elections, ending mass incarceration, women's law rights and rights for lesbian, gays, bisexual, transgender, queer persons. So it's a laundry list in various forms uh, covering all these standard things that progressives have tried to fight for over the last several years, a decade or so, I guess, maybe even longer. Uh, my first point about this is that there are differing versions of the Economic Bill of Rights, which doesn't help when you're trying to create a rallying point for all of us that we have to choose between them and decide, you know, which are important and which are not. And number two, there's too much stuff on those lists for us to really get a sense of what that vision, that democratic socialist vision is supposed to be about, other than the general idea that the government can run a lot of programs effectively to solve a lot of problems. So it's a large statement of faith in the government to fix problems. My question is, why don't we look at why the economy is not already doing those things for people? Why is the economy not providing good jobs at good wages? Why do people not have secure retirement? Why is there such mass incarceration? Why is there not uh, universal health care? All these things, I think, and I'll get to this at the end of the show as well, I think you have to have an analysis of how capitalism functions. Uh, it is capitalism the way the economy is organized. The emphasis is on creating profits for a small class of investors and not on providing all these other things or helping people out of poverty or anything like that. You know, you can have low wages, no health care. You can be find yourself terribly indebted through uh, credit cards, um, student debt, uh, uh, car loans, other things. Uh, you find it difficult to find affordable housing. None of those things are the emphasis in capitalism, the emphasis in making money for investors. So what is a democratic socialist vision? Here it is. Let's not critique the foundations of the economy, which I regard as capitalism. They would probably say that, well, capitalism functions well as long as the government can siphon off some of that money through taxing the wealthy, I don't know that they've said this in all these programs. In Bernie Sanders, he does have one little mention of taxing the wealthy, uh, but there's not a lot of talk about funding or how these things, all these different programs are going to be funded. Uh, so democratic socialism is let capitalism do its thing, and then we'll take some money from the people who are benefiting from it and create programs that the government will then run for other people. That's the vision. 
You may find that more persuasive than I do. You may have more confidence that capitalism is capable of running smoothly without any crises and that if we just redistribute some of this and uh, allocate more money to the government to create programs to help people with all the various problems they have, it can do that. Um, that's not a vision that is very compelling to me. I don't find it very persuasive. Get back to that point, but let me say right here, though, at the outset, that even though I'm going to critique this program, I would vote for a candidate, a Democratic candidate in a primary who had this program, and I would vote for a candidate in a general election who had this program. Why? Because I think it's a lot better, and this is why they're promoting it, a lot better than what the Republicans have to offer or that the centrist or moderate or whatever you want to call them, the other Democrats, the corporate Democrats, what they're offering. This program actually shows promise of helping people with financial problems that they have. It seems to have a wide uh White's public support. So I don't think they could actually do all these things if they got a lot of progressives in office and were able to pass whatever they wanted. It would just, you know, taxes would have to be raised too high and you'd have to reallocate money from the military or something. So they can't do everything they're promising, but they can get some good things done. And that's a lot better what, than what the others are offering. Now, even though I'd be willing to vote for people on the basis of the program of that policy platform or the Bill of Rights, as they call it. I wouldn't necessarily go beyond that. Voting is a low cost thing for me. It doesn't require a lot of time, effort or money. If I'm willing to donate money to a candidate, perhaps, but not to all the progressive candidates that are asking me for money currently, I can't afford it. And my wife wouldn't let me anyway. Uh, and I'm not willing to uh, do too much helping out of campaigns, um, canvassing for a particular candidate or anything like that, because I'm not full-throated supporter of this program. I think it's uh, unrealistic in a number of ways, particularly in what's what seems to run across all these is a federal job guarantee. In earlier programs, I've stated why I think that's just impractical. Yes, the government could create jobs for uh, people who are unemployed or people who should be, uh, the resources could be better used, human and uh, physical resources could be better used for things that the private market is neglecting. Uh, renewable energy, infrastructure, all that stuff. Government can create jobs programs and put people to work doing useful things that are going to benefit society. But that's different than a job guarantee. That's simply identifying what the government could do well and the private market is not doing well or cannot do well for various reasons, and ensuring that the government funds those programs and hires people to do the jobs. It's not a job guarantee. It's various types of public works programs or other types of programs that the government is incentivizing or funding directly. That's fine. But the job guarantee, what's the point of that? I'm not sure. It would create a lot of other, it just raises a lot of questions for me. And you can see my earlier show to get into that. Um, so it's, it's a laundry list of things and, uh, some, uh, you, I don't think they're capable of doing all of them, but I think it, it is susceptible to the criticism that you often hear about these types of progressive programs. Now, if you think of all the people who are voting for moderate Democrats, they're not all just doing it because those Democrats happen to win the primary. There's a lot of people in the primaries who are backing those kind of candidates because they see them as being more realistic or pragmatic or whatever you want to call it. It doesn't seem very realistic or pragmatic to say that you're going to have a government program for every single ill that besets society and effectively change that. I think you either have to say the government has limited capacity to address all these things and needs to prioritize which types of programs are the most important and the most feasible, or you have to critique the basis of the economy, as I would, and have a more socialist perspective saying we can't just have a bunch of programs. What we have to do is think of what kind of steps are going to lead us to a different kind of economy. So. Uh, that's the socialist critique. Let me go back to the uh, the moderate voters or the voters who vote for moderates. They they just don't they see this as trying to 
please everybody and gain a lot of votes by promising a lot of things that you're not going to be able to deliver on. Uh, it's It doesn't attract those type of people. Those type of people say they're suburbanites or they're middle income or whatever. They're more likely to see this as this is going to be quite a tax burden that might hurt me and the government's not going to be capable of doing all these things or it might do them badly or it's going to drain resources from the private sector, which could be better put to use. Uh, a lot of hesitations about such a large, all-encompassing program, all um, dependent on government doing a heck of a lot of different things competently and finding funding to do all that. All right, so I don't think it's going to rally everybody. Uh, I think it's going to rally people that are hurting and people that believe we could do better and people like me that would like to do something even more radical, if you want to call it radical, to the root. That's what radical means. Get to the root of the problems rather than just trying to uh, redistribute a lot of resources and let capitalism continue to create these problems in the first place. So that would be my first critique that the program is not as persuasive as they think it is. Yeah, a lot of people like it, but a lot of people like different components of it for different reasons. They'd have different priorities. A lot of questions would be raised down the line about how exactly this is going to happen. Um, federal job guarantee, I already mentioned that. Okay, uh, multiple things. Now let me play another clip about their take on socialism. And this is the other fellow, Alan Minsky speaking. Let's hear what he has to say. This is a little bit longer of a clip. Susie Weissman speaking first. These progressive demands, which are economic, social, political, and everything else, once they get into the rhetoric that we see in the in the media, it's all about cancel culture and you know critical race, all these other things which the left is not about. So there's like this, you know, you fight the Democrats, you fight the establishment media. Let's hear from you. <laughs> well, also they'll claim socialism, right? They'll declare that this is a radical socialist agenda when it's not, okay? And in fact, one of the paradoxes right now as people are more focused on foreign policy is who over the last 40 or 50, 60 years are America's closest allies, okay? They're actually all the other richest countries in the world, right? Japan, South Korea, Australia, Western Europe, Canada, right? None of them. None of them have large swaths of people living in dire poverty. You don't have mass incarceration. You do not have mass homelessness. You have, on every social index except for aggregate wealth, those countries are doing substantially better than we are. And we can make a case that all of those things should be and must be available to the American people, and we believe that that is a winning hand. It's not socialism. And when Harvey talked about democratic socialism, social democracy, it is social democracy. It isn't a challenge to the operation of capitalist markets. In fact, in social democracy, for the welfare of the average person, those are the best functioning capitalist markets. Oh, let me make a couple of points about that. Uh, first, I'm not so sure that what is going on in all those other countries can be compared to what's going on in the United States because we spend a lot more of our resources on military and those other countries depend on kind of a military backing from the United States for their own safety. That's changing now in the era of the UK, Ukraine situation. And also, the United States is much bigger. It's got a different political system. It's got you know all kinds of divisions within the society that some other smaller nations don't have. Uh, and also, those nations have been, like the United States, rolling back some of the protections that were already in place from earlier times. That is, you know, unions have had a harder time. Uh, they've been trying to make the retirement age later. They've been cutting some kinds of social benefits, cutting public services. The same things that have happened here in the 1980s, 90s, and onward have been happening in other countries. And the world is a lot more, the economy is a lot more global. It's a worldwide economy rather than simply a national economy. So I think we're subject to forces 
that make this kind of vision of, oh, they've done it in Western Europe or Northern European countries. We could do it here, or they've done it in Japan. We could do it here. I don't know that those comparisons are always effective, but I would agree that we could do a lot more than we are doing, which is why I would generally support this kind of program. But the thing I want to focus on is this uh, determined effort to disclaim that this is socialist. Now, I'm wondering why that seems so important to them to say it's not socialism. I think one of the most important things that Bernie Sanders has done in uh, his campaigns is rehabilitate the word socialism, even though he's connected it with what they call a democratic socialist program. You could say that this is a major step towards socialism, and I think that's what they are worried about, that what is his definition of socialism? Now, there's such a thing as market socialism. The idea has been around for a while and has been tried out in different ways. It's something that I would support. He says that uh, it's not socialism because these are market economies. I think what he means is they're capitalist economies, meaning that investing, the investing class runs, controls, and profits by businesses so that we can maintain that. Why do we want to maintain that? He doesn't say. He just says markets. Markets aren't necessarily the problem for all socialists. We're not trying to institute a completely planned uh, government-run ec economy. So let's just take that off the table in the first place. But what is, uh, what is a market like when you have this level of government intervention in the wage labor market? You with, with capitalism, you have wage labor, right? There's a market for labor. If you have a guaranteed federal job, even if you call it a last resort job, how are you going to ensure that people are not simply moving from the private sector to the public sector to get the better wages, benefits, security of the public job? If you have a living wage, not simply a raising of the minimum wage, but a minimum wage, which a lot of these Bill of Rights call for, you're going to if interfere with the market for labor across the board. Uh, none of the European or Japanese or South, South Korean countries, to, to my knowledge, have all of these programs in place, especially a guaranteed job for everybody. They have programs to try to increase employment by most of it creating incentives for the private market, but not everything on this list. The level of taxation, the level of government intervention in the wage labor market, the level of um, movement from private sector to the public sector of resources, that sounds a lot like economic planning. That sounds like a lot of interference with the market. Not that I think those are necessarily bad things. I'm just pointing out that when he says this is a market economy, I think that's somewhat disingenuous. What he's saying is, there will not be a totally planned economy, even though there will be a lot of planning. As an aside, there's a lot of planning in the economy now. It's just who's doing the planning. The big investment banks and the big uh, the people who own lots of wealth, those are the people who are doing the planning, the small set of people with the most wealth, instead of the people themselves. All right, so those couple of points I want to make of socialism, They're, they seem to be scared to death of the word socialism. Why? Because it has a negative connotation in our country. Why does it have a negative connotation? Because everybody who speaks on a public platform about socialism makes it sound like something they want to disavow. Be so, so it must be bad, right? If we keep saying, this ain't socialism. No, it's not socialism, even though it has some characteristics that might seem similar to socialism in various ways that we've understood socialism. We can't call it socialism because that's a bad word. And if it's a bad word, how can you ever talk about it? If you can't ever talk about it, how can you talk about all the problems that capitalism is creating? I think it moves people who uh, have that kind of critique of capitalism into a political ghetto which is something I resent and something I feel like I'm stuck in trying to break out of. Is this going to work? Is this vision going to move enough people to do something? Now, here's where I think the biggest thing missing from their platform is an acknowledgement that the two-party system is not going to deliver on this. Now, they at various points say 
if people don't get behind the Democratic Party, it's simply not going to happen. You're not going to be able to achieve this through other means. You got to get involved in elections. You got to get involved in electing progressives and Democratic primaries. Why aren't people buying that message? Why do I think a lot of people will be hesitant to buy that message? Well, simply because the demonstration on a big scale by Bernie Sanders that you can promise all this stuff and you can dedicate yourself to his campaign, donate money to his campaign, which I have done, donate time to his campaign, which I did to a limited extent, but not as enthusiastically because I didn't think he was going to win the primary. And then what do you get? You don't get all these programs. You get Joe Biden or you get Hillary Clinton as your only choice. That's why people have called Bernie a sheepdog. I don't think Bernie intentionally leads people into that cul-de-sac, but that's the thing that people experience. Progressives say you got to do these things. You know, you, you got to support these people because they're going to do all these things, but they find they try to support these people and the political system itself keeps those people from gaining office or from gaining any uh, degree of, or, or they just deliver you over as a voter to a set of choices, neither of which is backing that agenda. And the big thing missing from this platform is an acknowledgement that we need to change our electoral system. Imagine if there was a third party that was actually able to run and compete without the disadvantages of our political system, our electoral system. One of the things the public has asked for, they don't just ask for all these economic programs, they very much want a third party. They want another choice. They don't want to just have the choice of Democrats or Republicans. That's why I think this is missing election reform, electoral reform. When they talk about it, they simply talk about money in politics and how we can get rid of money in politics, but that don't solve the problem of only having two choices. And in a lot of places, only one choice, one or the other of the major parties is going to dominate either through gerrymandering or through only a certain type of people moving to a certain location. You got to have electoral reform. There's a movement for electoral reform. They know about it because uh, ranked choice voting has been promoted as the, you know, for years and years and is becoming better known. Uh, Andrew Yang is backing it. They got it statewide in Maine. It's been in the news. There's been bills proposed in the Congress. I'm sure these folks have heard of it. I don't think ranked choice is the best or the last word on electoral reform, but they don't even add that to their platform that we need a way to break the two party system. If you can't do that, you can't have any of these good things because you'll you get that bait and switch. You try to promote progressives and you end up getting um, these other kinds of Democrats. And who wants to be associated with that? So going back to an earlier statement, why don't I donate more money? Why don't I work more for this kind of program? Because it's not my ideal program and because it's just ephemeral. I back candidates, I give money to candidates, and then it's gone. If their campaign fails, there's nothing they've left behind. They may have amassed an email list for their next run or to help somebody else run, but they haven't left us, left us a lasting organization which continues can continue to push for a platform like this and have that as its uh, standard that a people associate. This party is for these things, clearly and simply. You can't tell what the Democrats are for. You can't tell if you're getting a progressive or a moderate. Sometimes you get one, sometimes you get the other. Mostly you get the other, the worst one. We need a different political uh, electoral system, a different electoral system, so you can have a real shot at having organizations, building organizations instead of building candidates up who run and then they're gone and you're left with nothing or maybe little slivers of hope. So that's my word on this. Uh, I'd like to hear what you have to say. You can leave your comments on the Political Dharma YouTube channel, or if you're listening to this on podcast, you can go over to the Allen on Politics Facebook page. I still haven't changed the name of it. and I really like to get off Facebook anyway. And you can go there and you can leave comments. Maybe it's better to go to YouTube uh, and leave the comments there. Anyway, thanks a lot for listening. Hope this was a little more put together than last week. And I'll be back again next weekend with a new show on a new topic.
Bye.